Hey everybody, we are off this week, but to keep the content coming, we are sharing an installment of After Dark from the archives. Laura, I think you kind of planned this one back when we did it in for episode 906. Can you tell everybody what to look forward to today? Yeah, so on this one, we uh, are going on a three-way polygamous date to find out if these 36 questions from the New York Times can help us fall in love even more with each other. Oh, or less. <laughs> fall out of love. <laughs> <laughs> or less. Yeah. And to that point, um, I do still in retrospect wonder, Andrew, why are so many of your questions about death on our first date? I was going for a theme. <laughs> Maybe this is why I was ghosted on Bumble BFF. I started asking death related questions to my potential friends. Yeah, seems sus. So things do get pretty vulnerable and deep. And it was a really good discussion. So we thought we would share this one this week. And if you enjoy this installment of After Dark, we release a new After Dark exclusively for patrons and Apple podcast subscribers every week. We record it right after the main show, and we try to come up with a lot of good content behind the paywall to thank you for supporting us. And by the way, exciting news, we are now offering free trials to our Patreon. Sign up for seven days of access to Millennial. And in that time, you'll get access to everything at the level you're pledging at, like our live streams, ad-free millennial, After Dark, Cashing It Out, The Variety Show, and more. So patreon.com slash millennial is where you can sign up for, the first time ever, a trial. Without further ado, here's free access to episode 906's After Dark. Enjoy. This is After Dark for 906, and the wine will be flowing tonight. So I'll show off our wine. Mm, this has really had a chance to breathe over the last oh. hour and a half. Mm, so has mine, freed from the box and ready to <laughs> be sipped. All right. Cheers. All right. Cheers. All right, well, we can start with a sip. Sure. Mm. The 36 questions that lead to love. This is from the New York Times. This isn't new, right? But people refer back to this. Oh, yeah, it's from 2015. It introduces the idea by saying, in Mandy Lynn Katrin's modern love essay, To Fall in Love with Anyone, Do This, she refers to a study by the psychologist Arthur Aaron and others that explores whether intimacy between two strangers can be accelerated by having them ask each other a specific series of personal questions. The 36 questions in the study are broken up into three sets, with each set intended to be more probing than the previous set. The idea is that mutual vulnerability fosters closeness. So we look through this list, and each of us brought one question from each set. And we're going to ask the question to the other two panelists. So the first question, this is from set one. Laura and Pam, do you have a secret hunch about how you will die? Yeah. Really? I, I don't, but I assume that I will live for a very long time because old age runs in my family. Oh, nice. Yeah. Women in my family tend to live pretty long. They tend to get into their 80s, like late 80s, sometimes early 90s. So I think... And maybe this is me being optimistic, but I think that I will have a long life. But I do think, and this is, it's going to sound really morbid, but it's just, I think it's just looking at odds. Most people in my family die of cancer. So mm. I'm, ass I'm assuming that's what's going to happen to me. Something has to get us all in the end, right? All right. Well, so if I was on a date with you, I'd be like, oh, damn. I mean, she really has an understanding of how she's going to end her life. So or how her life is going to end, I should say. <laughs> I respect that. I respect that. You've thought it through. You think ahead. That's good. Plus one. I'm already thinking I'm going to call Laura up for another date. And you too, Pam. <laughs> okay. So my next question, this is from set two. And I thought, well, since I asked a question about death in set one, I might as well continue the theme. I, I decided that when I saw another question about death in set two. So if you knew that in one year you would die suddenly, would you change anything about the way you are now living and why? 
I think I would just start spending more money frivolously, like on, on a, that. excursions, because you can't take it Ooh, with you. Yeah. You know, I'm, so I'm not talking about things, but it's like, why am I going to save all this money if I'm just going to die in a year? And I love that because people always say you get more value out of experiences over things, right? So that's respectable. Right, that's great. Exactly. You also can't take things with you. So you might as well, you know, spend it all on excursions and stuff. I agree. Um, I think I would live my life very differently if yeah. I knew something like this was going to happen to me. Um, I would quit my job. First yes. of all, like, <laughs> bye bye, <why>? millennial. <laughs> I mean, no, I like this does not feel like a job to me. I mean, my day job, like, not, and I mean, my, there's nothing wrong with my day job, but if you know that you have 365 days left of your life, why are you going to spend the vast majority of that working? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I, I would try to find a way to quit my job and just focus on like what Pam said, trying to travel or just trying to spend time with people that I really care about making the most of the time. Yeah. I'd be on the road the whole final year for sure. Yeah. Eating, traveling, experiencing. Yeah. Fucking. You try all the drugs. Yeah, exactly. I don't actually. I, was just I don't. Thinking that. <laughs> yeah. What? Fucking or the, drugs? Well, both. You try oh. all the drugs. You fuck all the people. I don't know if I would try all the drugs, honestly. I, that well, doesn't appeal to me. But... Every, anything you're curious about, I just think that you would. Yeah. Do with no, yeah. there's no consequence. Sex with a woman. I mean, I've been. Why or not? Do I want to go to the grave as a gold star gay? I think. I think the latter. <laughs> I think I want to go to the grave as a gold star. <laughs> So on my gravestone, here lies Andrew, gold star gay. Gold star gay. <laughs> we can make sure that's inscribed on your tombstone if that's what you want. Right, Perfect. exactly. Even Perfect. if it doesn't end up being true. even by I love so- how the <laughs> assumption on the show is always that Andrew's going to go first. <laughs> so Lauren, I will make sure that his tombstone reads gold star gay. <laughs> well, has it? Andrew, haven't you said before that you want to die at like 60 yes. or something? Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, I think I said something like that. Like, that sounds like enough, long enough. <laughs> 60 or 70. Though now now that I l- see how much I'm getting from Social Security, I need to make it to like 65. <laughs> I need to collect from the government. <laughs> yeah, you got to like justify paying that Social Security tax. <laughs> it feels like we're on a polygamous date right now. <laughs> I know. I kind of love it. <laughs> All right. And my final question, again, continuing with the death theme, just to make this a cohesive set of questions. Of all the people in your family whose death, this one is actually sad. Of all the people in your family whose death would you find most disturbing and why? I'm I'm having trouble um, like discerning what disturbing means. Like, is it just like shocking or is it just like which one's going to impact you the most? I I was just thinking about that too. Let's say impact the most, saddest, impact the most. Yeah. You know, like, I guess this is probably the point. Um, I always knew that my grandma's death was really going to hit me hard and it did. Um, Like I'm getting choked up just thinking about it. But I think like aside from her, it would be my brother. It would be so Yeah. Yeah, especially yeah. because he's younger he's than me. Close. So if he if he goes first, that would just be like shocking. Sorry yeah. to bring down the mood. <laughs> no, it's fine. I mean, that was like the point. I think the point is to like, like you get to set three and you're like, oh, that's really deep. Right. Yeah. So mm-hmm. how about you, Laura? So I assume for the purposes of this exercise, I can't say Mark because that's the true answer. Um, but if if we're assuming that this is like we're on a three way date. I never knew Mark. He's not part of the, he's not in the picture. Oh, I see. Okay. <laughs> right. So for the purposes of this exercise, if that's the case, um, my brother as well would be my answer. I mean, anyone in my immediate family is yeah. going to rock me, but with my brother, he's younger, just like Pam was talking about. So that's part of it. It's the protective older sister thing. Um, it's also just the fact that like, I don't have any other siblings. So if my brother were to die before me, um, I would like, I wouldn't have anybody. And presumably if our parents go first, 
then I really have nobody, you know? Yeah. So I think yeah. that's the one that did would your, be the hardest. Did your parents have like, did they plan to have two kids? Because my mom always talks about this with us. She was just like, the plan was always to have at least two because I didn't want you guys to be alone. Like, I wanted you guys to have each other. And that's something that, like, we've grown up our whole lives hearing. Yeah. So we're, like, hyper aware of the fact that, like, we we come as a set on purpose. Yeah. My mom is an only child. And because of that, she specifically wanted – she did not want – to have an only child they originally wanted three kids actually my parents but... did too but then they got divorced <laughs> oh my parents had the second one and they were just like uh we're done <laughs> <laughs> yeah anyone in my immediate family would rock me for sure but i think my mom just jumps to top of mind for obvious reasons all right. Well, those are my three questions i both admire and love you even more than i did before i ask those questions and I'm definitely taking you out for another date here in Utah. Well, I don't know. If you're only going to ask about death, I might not hit you back. <laughs> <laughs> Lauren Pam leaves I'm going to ghost you. Oh, he's depressing. I'm ghost Jesus you. Christ. <laughs> I know. I'll be like, Pam, do you want to go out again? Right, exactly. And I'll be like, yes. <laughs> Jesus <laughs> Christ of Latter-day Saints is he depressing. <laughs> we, don't, we definitely do not follow the three-hour rule with texting Andrew after we go on our date. <laughs> Not at all. <laughs> but I definitely make sure that Laura got home safe and I make sure to tell her I had a good time. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's, that's where we're at so far. Okay. So uh, my first one from set one, I think it's surprising this is in set one because I feel like it can be a really deep question. But Pam and Andrew, um, if you could change anything about the way you were raised, what would it be? I have two things. One, I was growing up in the suburbs of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, and like I had a life and friends there, and I always wonder what would have happened if I didn't if we didn't as a family move to New Jersey. I had a whole new set of friends, like it totally changed my life. And I don't think it negatively impacted me necessarily, but I always wonder how different would my life have been, especially because I didn't really have a lot of, as I've brought up before, a lot of friends in middle school, elementary school, high school. So I did have more of this online life. And because of that, it led me to all of this, which is amazing. But would I still have done all this if I stayed in Western Pennsylvania? We never moved eastward. I It's, it's something I think about from time to time because I do think my life would probably be very different. If I had a different set of friends, I would have spent spent less time online. My fourth grade teacher wouldn't have read Harry Potter to me. How would I have been introduced to Harry Potter? Like everything changed because of that move. So that's what I would change just out of curiosity. I'd love to know how different my life would be. Um and then the other thing is my uh dad very much sheltered me. I've talked before about like how he fast forwarded through scenes in Titanic or at my birthday party. He wouldn't let us watch South Park with my friends. It was like super embarrassing. Like I wasn't seen as cool amongst the friends that I did have because my dad was like a total prude when it came to like letting me watch certain things. So I was actually going to bring up sheltering as well. I think that sheltering played a big role in my upbringing. So in addition to the fast forward thing, it's like, um, we weren't really allowed to do sleepovers. Like, I think I can count on like one hand, the number of times that I was actually allowed to sleep over at friends houses. And it, it was kind of a result of uh, just growing up in a very a family that really wanted to shelter. And I think like, in a weird sort of way that was uh, born out of fear on their part but then it also like weirdly like I think it made me more nervous and fearful of certain things to the point where like when I started college and I was living in the dorms I, I had to like um like the first week almost like I didn't go out at all and then I was like oh I don't have to ask anybody permission to like leave the house like I can go and do whatever I want I don't have to like Nobody is telling me no. I don't have to like ask permission of my parents or my grandparents. I don't have to like if I do something like they don't have to know about everything that I'm 
doing, which was like a weird revelation. And lucky for them, I'm fairly level headed and I didn't go like super crazy because I think you see that a lot in kids that are sheltered um, or fear mongered. Uh, But I do think that, you know, I I would have benefited from having a little bit more leeway because like both my brother and I were very responsible children. So if like the reins had been loosened a little bit earlier, I think we would have both benefited from that a lot. It's interesting that you shared that because I found myself thinking when you both gave your answers, you you both alluded to ways in which it made you feel uncool or just left out when you were kids, that you were sheltered and you weren't allowed to do certain things. But I wanted to follow up and ask, what impact did that have on you when you reached adulthood? And Pam, I think you gave a great example of that. Andrew, do you feel like there's any impact you've seen in your adult years because of the sheltering? Um, Probably. I'm not as extroverted as I think I would like to be. Like when I'm on the podcast, when I'm doing podcast stuff, when I'm having meetings with people online or even in person, like uh, I'm good. I'm on. But like the the step towards like going out the step towards initiating a social setting, like that's still a very big leap for me. And if I didn't have some of the sheltering that we're talking about, maybe things would be different. Well, um, so far, I feel like I definitely want to take you both out for another date. Yes. Oh, thank God. This free preview of After Dark will continue in just a moment. For question two, you could keep it surface level if you want to, but you can also go pretty deep with it. Is there something that you've dreamed of doing for a long time? And as a follow up, why haven't you done it? I think mine's kind of surface level. I would just like to travel abroad more. I've been to England many times, but I would love to get to Australia. I'd love to get to Germany because I'm half German. Those two are the biggest. I just, the first time I traveled abroad to England, it was so refreshing. It's just all the newness hitting you at once, like this whole different world. And I was 16 the first time I traveled over there. It was 2006, so maybe 17. It was just like, I'll always remember that feeling of how different everything was. And I want to experience that more times. And why haven't I done it? It's expensive. And in the case of uh, in the case of Australia, it's very far. <laughs> Are you afraid of taking a flight that far? No, it's not that. It's just it sounds like a lot of effort. <laughs> I don't know. It it I guess I'm not afraid. It's the idea is daunting. I do want to do it one day. My fear won't stop me. It's just, yeah, it's a big trip. That's all. I'd like to, I think I've said this before, but I'd really like to write a book at some point. Um And basically, the reason I haven't done it is because it takes a lot of time to write a book. And also, um, writing is a very solitary activity, which doesn't necessarily bother me. But I think that what people say about how you have like your whole life to write your first book is very true. But at the same time, the fact that there is no timeline, and, uh, you know, there there really is, uh, as a, as a result, no deadline to that because you want to make sure it's as good as it can be before you like send it off to potentially get published it is it feels like much more of a daunting task because it's not like I don't do writing but it's like a different type of writing what genre would you be interested in would it be fiction would it be memoir I think it probably it would be fiction memoir would be interesting I have thought about that but um, or like, I, I think I would actually really love to do like some kind of like oral history, too. I think that would be really, really fun if I found a topic I was like really passionate about. That's cool. Do it. Do it. Yeah. Do it. You too, Andrew. Travel? OK. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's sounds easy. So, <laughs> it sounds so easy for both of those things to say, just do it. But the reality is. Well, I mean, like that is the first step, right? Is like not just saying like I'd like to do something is like taking an active step to do the thing. Right. Yeah. So. Yeah. This is a whole other discussion, but I still need to work out like being able to take extended time off instead of like workations or just a few days yeah. off. Like if I'm going to Australia, I need like two weeks and I just 
can't really do that right now. I get that. Because you feel like you can't put off work or your obligations for that long. But then a few years in the future, you might look back and think, well, that was silly. I think we all do that. That's true. When we think about when we were younger, for example, some of the things that we would convince ourselves we had to do. And now we look back on them with the perspective of being in our mid thirties and we're like, well, that was stupid. Yeah. And it's not so much like being on millennial and muggle cast. It's that people depend on me to get their podcast done. Mm -hmm. And now I've been working with actually one of our listeners, Andre, when I initially made that call over a year ago on the show being like, any other podcast editors out there? And he's been amazing. Um, But it's a matter of like kind of working out that setup for an extended period of time. And that's on me. So this one's um, I'm actually going to direct y'all to address each other. Um, I was wondering how this one was going to work. I was like, maybe Laura just wants us to tell her stuff, nice stuff about herself. Yeah. I was like, wow, this is going to be self-serving. <laughs> no, not, a, not at all. I want you both to tell each other what you like about each other. Be very honest, saying things that you might not say to someone you've just met. This is such a weird dynamic for our uh, polygamous relationship. I know. <laughs> wow. Well, listen, I need to know that you're both secure in yourselves before I'm willing to embark on this thruple together. And like each other. (laughs) Yeah. I need to know that this is going to be a healthy dynamic. That's fair. Well, let's see. Pam is a lot of fun. She's such a good friend. She, I haven't told you to this yet, but I'm currently seeing somebody else and she's very good and nice to him as well. And they get along. So that's been really nice to see and important to me. She is very driven and is an amazing part of Millennial and everything we've worked on together. That's why we've worked together for so long. Oh, and she knows her shit when it comes to like a lot. I look smarter thanks to her. That's the sweetest thing you've ever said to me. <laughs> it's true, though. Well, um, I... Don't know if I've ever told you this, but I feel like so and this I don't know if this is gonna like come across this way, but I consider this to be a very high compliment. So I just want you, you to know that I feel very safe with you. And I think that Aww. that is really important. And it's like a huge um like it's really important to like a foundation to any kind of friendship. But I just like it's really nice to like have people in your life and you know that they're always looking out for your best interests, they always have your back. And I just really appreciate knowing that in addition to, you know, knowing that you're reliable, dependable, I feel like we share a lot of similar traits. I know that you're very driven and stuff like that, that you're just somebody that I can count on and depend on outside of work. And I just think that that's really great. Oh, that's really sweet. Thank you. That was beautiful. And it was a great example of it taking a compliment and not feeling the need to like over justify it somehow or <laughs> right or like give the other person the same exact compliment in return you guys did great i feel safe with you too pam though i do but yeah <laughs> no it's very true y'all y'all are a, you're both you're a good bunch um i really am super like for this podcast sake i'm like really happy that we have that we're all three on here because i feel like the podcast dynamic is the best it's ever been, to be honest. But um, I feel like I've got really strong personal relationships with both of you. And it feels like we can talk about things outside of the sphere of the show and like understand the difference between what's for the show and, and the things that aren't for the show. And in that sense, it feels like a really safe space. And um, you two are some of the people that I get the most FaceTime with, as it were, just because we do um, our shows so frequently that I feel like I have a really deep connection with both of you and like a long term connection, even though I can count on like, all like, my hands, how many times we've been together in person. It's weird. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, I know. I know. Yeah. I wish there was more of that, but just because of where we all live, it's yeah. tough. 
But, but to, that, um, to that point, Laura, it is like, I don't know. I There's something so um like warm and fuzzy about knowing that you've seen people through different stages of their lives and like they've seen you through different yeah. stages. And I think about this a lot because I grew up having the same group of friends through high school, but I don't talk to like any of them anymore. And sometimes that's kind of sad because you think about like how long you spent in each other's lives. But then on the other hand, I think about people like you two and it's like, oh, but like I don't have my high school friends anymore. But like, you know, I still have people that I I've kept through different stages. And I think that that's really nice. I agree. That was beautifully put. It was. Yeah. I mean, we've got a good thing going here. It's, I know uh... we we got to we got to stop jacking each other off now <laughs> right, exactly. and move on to Pam's <laughs> questions. Yes. All right. Well, to lighten things up, I would like both of you to tell me what would constitute a perfect day for you. Being outside, having good food, being surrounded by good company, a day that takes your mind off of the things that are currently annoying you or stressing you out in life, having a new experience, just like a refreshing day. Yeah, I think about one of those days where you're surrounded by the people who you care about the most. And you're experiencing something to Andrew's point that is unique and kind of, I don't know, it kind of forms relationships in a way because you have a very vivid memory of an experience together. Those things always stick out to me. Like I think about um, we did an escape room with a couple of our friends a few years ago, and that was such a great bonding experience. It was so simple. It didn't require much of us apart from we just went to the location and we did the room together, but it forced us to problem solve together and to see each other under stress and to be able to like cope or not cope so well with that stress. Um, You get to learn a lot about people in those settings. I think more than you do by just going out to a bar for a drink, for example. And those memories stick out really, really clearly in your head. So like doing something like an escape room um, or like even a theme park, some of my memories of going to theme parks with y'all like Universal Studios, those are so vivid for me because we were experiencing a theme park, but it was also a Harry Potter convention and Wizarding World had just opened. So it was like this confluence of unique, like once in a lifetime things to be happening all at once. Um, And I was there with some of the people I'm closest with. So yeah, days like that stick out. For sure. It's always very surreal when we get together because we work together online so often. Back in like 2010 or even before that, like going back to Lumos 2006, like our only communication with each other was really over Skype. Like that was our main mode of transportation or main (laughs) main mode of uh, correspondence. And I don't think maybe we texted a little bit, but not a lot. It was like we were talking on Skype and AIM. And then so for this person to suddenly be brought into the w- real world for a weekend was just surreal. So that that made it really special. What do you both value most in friendship? Being able to say whatever the hell you want to that person at any time of day. And I think not just like something you wouldn't tweet, but if you can just like randomly text somebody throughout the day, any random shit like that means a lot to me <laughs> we i don't know if that's uh, like odd to say but like it's just fun to like want to g- have something that you want to get off your chest and you just throw it at this person and they will respond with something more than you know haha they'll just like receive whatever you throw at them and then of course being able to talk to them about whatever you want and like having a helpful conversation and having a good time irl yeah to me that kind of comes across as something that I really value in a friendship, which is knowing that there are truly no judgments, that you can yeah. be unapologetically yourself. And that includes sharing the times when you fucked up and knowing that that person is a good enough friend to tell you that you fucked up, but they still love you anyway. Bingo. That's it. 
that's it for me right there. All right. Last question here. I feel like this is an age old question in many ways. Um, So imagine for a moment your house containing everything you own is on fire. And after saving everyone you love and your pets, you have time to safely make a final dash to save one item. What are you saving and why? <laughs> uh, you two know what I'm going to say. Definitely my signed Bruce book. <laughs> I, I wasn't sure if you were going to say that or your hard drive. <laughs> my hard drive? No, I back up to the cloud. I'm safe. Oh, okay. I'm safe. True. And I do it for that exact reason. So I can grab the Bruce book. But now I also have the Bruce and Obama book. So I got two Bruce signatures and one Obama signature. But the Bruce signature, I got that, you know, in person. So that means more to me. So I think it's going to be that. Everything else is replaceable. And sure, the signed book is too. But like, I got that at that event. So that means a lot to me. So I think I think that's it. It's really tempting to say that if you've gotten everyone you love and your pets out, that you're good. Yeah. That's sort of like my natural inclination is to be like, I mean, at that point, everything that is truly irreplaceable is handled. But I do have one thing that I would want to rescue if it were safe for me to do so. It's a sentimental thing. It's it's all emotional value. There's no financial value to it. I have... Um, this stuffed animal named Droopy. I had a lot of stuffed animals as a kid, and I still have some of my favorite ones. The reason that Droopy is so special is because he he's like a basset hound stuffed animal. Um, he has like little button eyes. Um, but the reason that he's so special is because he was my mom's when she was a little kid. So this thing is like 60 years old, and it definitely looks its age. Um, It is tattered. It is missing an eye. One of its ears is falling off. It's got a tear in the belly. Um, But I've just had it for so long, and it made so many moves with me all over the country as a kid. And even as an adult, I've taken it everywhere I've gone when I've moved somewhere. So that would be something that I would want to hold on to. That's so sweet. That's a good answer. Yeah. Yeah. Now you're reminding me that I have items from my childhood in the garage. So I guess I should reconsider. (laughs) Think about it. Get the one that you would want to save and put it on your dresser. I just need to take it all out of the house. That way I never have to worry about it. I was going to say, do you all ever, like, when you're um, moving things around, do you ever think, I'm going to put all the sentimental stuff next to each other so I can grab it if I need to? Yeah. Oh, I hadn't thought about it that way before, but I do kind of have all the old stuff together, so Mm -hmm. that works out. Yeah. Pam, what would your answer be? We got to hear your answer. I uh, I feel like it it has changed um, over the years, but I inherited a necklace and I wear it every day now. But it, assuming that it wasn't on for whatever reason, so like say there was a fire at night because um, I don't wear it to bed, then I would um, then I would grab that first. Well, are we going to go on a second date here in Salt Lake City, Utah? I guess so. Yeah, I think, I think so. so. Y'all are weirded out by my obsession over Bruce, but you're going to come back. Give him a, give me another shot. Yeah. I think that this would be like um like a go home and Netflix and get to second base type date. Oh, and then wow. I would think about the death questions and be like, okay, let's <laughs> pump the brakes here and maybe wait to go all the way until date number two. Okay. Well, I guess like he didn't kill us. So, right. you know. <laughs> Moving on up slowly but surely. Fascinated yep. by death, but not enough to kill you. <laughs> I just started with that one question. I was like, let me continue the death theme. No, just like I'm on a roll. It was, it was very cohesive, but it was just so funny to see those out of context. Like, damn, you just picked all the death <laughs> questions. <laughs> <sighs> well, I'm almost finished my glass of wine. I am oh. feeling it. Me too. I have been Sam. feeling it. I didn't eat dinner yet, so me yeah. either. <laughs> I also just don't drink that much anymore, so it doesn't take a whole mm-hmm. lot. I may have also had like a quarter of a gummy before we recorded tonight, so that's part Fair. of it too. You're feeling a couple buzzes. Nice. <laughs> yeah, just little ones though. Good. All right. Well, cheers. Happy Valentine's Day, everybody. Yeah, happy Valentine's Day. 
See y'all next time. Bye. Bye, Bye. y'all. Happy Love Day. All right, that was our After Dark from 906. Don't forget, you can get more installments of After Dark over at patreon.com slash millennial. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in, and we'll be back with a normal episode next week. Bye, Bye. y'all.